Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Cathy Creswell. I'm from the Department of Experimental Psychology here at the University of Oxford, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the latest in our, our mental wellness um, series, which is hosted by the Department of Experimental Psychology here. And um, Hopefully some of you have managed to join us for some of our other sessions. This today is the last of our sessions for this academic year, but please do go back and have a look at the other sessions if you haven't had a chance. They're all on our um, Experimental Psychology website or on our YouTube channel. And there's a number of really fantastic sessions there, including topics such as stress and anxiety, low mood, trauma, um, overcoming problems with sleep and eating. Um, and today's session will also be is being live streamed on YouTube and uh, can be watched back there afterwards as well. Just one last thing to mention before we get started is that we always try and finish our sessions by 10.45 and like to, we'd like to really encourage you to take a little break uh, after the session. Obviously the sessions that we're running do um, may raise some uh, difficulties for some people. They all cover quite sensitive topics. So we would like to really encourage you to take a moment uh, rather than just uh, steam into the next part of your day. So hopefully you'll have at least 15 minutes to give yourself a bit of a breather before you move on to your next activity. But without further ado, I'd now like to introduce you to Dr. Eleanor Lee, who's a Wellcome Trust Clinical Research Fellow here in the Oxford Centre for Anxiety Disorders and Trauma and the Department of Experimental Psychology. And Dr. Lee is also a principal clinical psychologist, and she's going to be talking to us today about bullying and anxiety. So thanks ever so much for joining us, Eleanor. Thank you, Cathy. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, so. I'm going to share my screen talking to you about bullying and anxiety. So relationships are central to our lives, but they're not always easy. They can be painful and invariably they're complex and nuanced. So I wanted to begin today thinking through with you what is bullying. I'm going to present a few scenarios and I want you to decide whether you think this is an example of bullying or not, or if you're not sure. And a poll will be showing up on your screen where you can rate your, uh, give your answers as we go. So the first example, someone in your friendship circle tends to speak over you and doesn't invite you to gatherings. Do you think that's an example of bullying or not? Or are you not sure? Oh. Number two, False rumours about you and someone you dated are spread on social media. Do you think this is an example of bullying or not, or are you not sure? Number three, a friend calls you a derogatory name in an argument. And number four, someone you work or study with frequently takes the credit for your work. So we'll just give you a few minutes to Give your answers, a few seconds to give your answers. And we can end the poll. Okay, so I'm going to, so here we've got the results through and what we can see is that um, for the first example, someone in your friendship circle tends to speak over you, um, a majority thought that this was an example of bullying, but a large proportion, 43%, were unsure. For the second, the false rumours being spread. The majority of you felt quite certain this was bullying for 78%, but still nearly 20% were unsure. The third example, a friend calls you a derogatory name in an argument. Um, here, um, you were fairly evenly split between thinking 40% this was an example of bullying, 35% were unsure. And finally, number four, people, uh, someone taking credit for your work. The majority of you, 73% thought this was an example of bullying, but still 14% were unsure. So I think what this really highlights is that um, 
is that it can be quite difficult to know whether a particular um, incident or behavior is an example of bullying. And what's so important is the context and understanding it over time. <clears throat> so bullying is behavior by an individual or group that's intended to cause harm to another individual or group. It's not typically an isolated act, but it's part of a broader pattern of behavior that's repeated over time. It usually involves an imbalance of power, which makes it difficult for the victim to defend themselves. And that could be driven by a range of factors. So physical stature and strength or social status within a group, seniority within the workplace um, or the number of people. So it could be, for example, that you have a large, a larger group of um, more junior colleagues in a position of power over a more senior member of staff. Bullying targets perceived difference. And that can be perceived in, in many different ways. For example, um, physical appearance, body weight or shape, disability, gender, uh, sexual minority status, um, race, religion, uh, refugee status, to name but a few. It can be hard to get a handle of how common bullying is because different, um, there are so many different methods used to measure it. But what we seem to see is that amongst young people, about one in six report having been bullied to a distressing level in the previous year. And in the workplace, about one in 10 report experiencing problematic bullying in the last six to 12 months. And if you just ask yourself these questions, have I ever been or am I currently being bullied? Or do I know somebody who is or has been bullied in the past? I think that almost all of us would answer yes to at least one of these questions which really gives us a feel for how widespread this problem is. When we think of bullying, what typically first comes to mind is overt bullying. So this could be verbal name calling, using demeaning language, making inappropriate jokes, or it can be physical, so hitting, hurting. This kind of bullying is more often used by males than females, and it's more common in children rather than adolescents and adults. A more subtle form of bullying is what we call relational or social bullying. And this is where people use aspects of a relationship to cause harm or distress someone else. So it might be excluding someone from a WhatsApp group in a repeated way, not letting somebody know about the change of time for an important meeting. This is really powerfully described in a book by Margaret Atwood called Cat's Eye in which Elaine, the protagonist, is reflecting back on her early experiences of relationships, and in particular a relationship with a girl called Cordelia. So I'm just going to read you a short extract. I'm standing outside the door to Cordelia's room. Cordelia, Grace and Carol are inside. They're having a meeting. The meeting's about me. I'm just not measuring up, although they are giving me every chance. I'll have to do better, but better at what? Purdy and Miri come up the stairs in their armour of being older. I long to be as old as they are. They're the only people who have any real power over Cordelia that I can see. I think of them as my allies, or I think they would be my allies if only they knew. Knew what? Even to myself, I am mute. They smile at me, condescending and kind, and head towards their room to do their toenails and talk about older things. I lean against the wall. From behind the door comes the indistinct murmur of voices, of laughter exclusive and luxurious. You can come in now, says the voice of Cordelia from inside the room. I think this extract describes so powerfully what it feels like to be socially excluded. You can also pick up that um, Cordelia's power is from her social status within the group. And Elaine feels that and she wishes she were older in order to redress that power imbalance. Another really important thing that comes through from this extract is how particularly with relational bullying, it can be so hard to pick up from the outside. So Purdy and Miri don't spot it at all. But more than that, as a victim, we can know something is wrong, but it can be very hard to articulate what it is. So for Elaine, she says, if only they knew, knew what, even to myself, I am mute. And related to this, what so often happens is when we're experiencing um, bullying, we internalize it or blame ourselves for that behavior, which makes it even harder to call out. So for Elaine, she thinks I am not measuring up, although they are giving me every chance. Reputational bullying is where 
um, someone tries to harm someone else by damaging their reputation. And a, a good example of this is cyberbullying, where, where rumours are spread about somebody. Bullying can happen anywhere. Most commonly, it happens in the workplace or in the learning environment, but that can spill out into, the, um, into one's local community. And of course, we have cyberbullying. Um, there was concern that there'd be an explosion in cyberbullying with the proliferation of social media and smartphones, but that doesn't seem to have happened. So rates have remained fairly steady at about 7%. And we see that bullying in person and bullying online aren't independent. So by that, I mean that if you're bullied in person, you're more vulnerable to being bullied online. So this is a, a sort of slightly flippant and controversial question, but I think it's important to ask us because this, these views were held um, not too long ago. Um, but, you know, does bullying matter? Do we need to worry about it? Or is bullying just a part of life? You have to take the rough with the smooth. It helps children deal with the cruelties of the world. Well, I'm going to hand over and go back to literature to give a feel for the impact of bullying at an individual level. So this is, um, I'm going to hand over to Piggy, a character in The Lord of the Flies, which is a book about a group of schoolboys who are um, left to fend for themselves on a desert island after a plane crash. And Piggy is being bullied by a dominant member of the, of the group. I'm scared of him, said Piggy, and that's why I know him. If you're scared of someone, you hate him, but you can't stop thinking about him. You kid yourself he's all right really and then when you see him again it's like asthma and you can't breathe. This is a bit like a sucker punch this uh, quote when I read it. Um, it. It really gives a kind of visceral feel to how frightening it is to, being, to be bullied whether that's physically whether that's in a psychological way and in the moment when you're with your bully it can make you feel like you can't breathe. But more than that is the ongoing anxiety and worry that um, plagues people when they are being bullied. So it's no surprise that um, through, across the lifespan, if we're experiencing bully, it makes, bullying, it makes us feel anxious, it can make us feel low and depressed, and sometimes even suicidal. And it gets in the way of our day-to-day -day lives. So um, we know that um, victims of, of bullying tend to take more time off um, study and work, and they are often a bit less productive. So a question then is, is what, what about the long-term impacts? Is the effect of bullying, does it continue even after bullying stops? And I'm gonna focus in here on anxiety a bit more. Um, so um, this, is just, this is a study that looked at the experience of experiencing of bullying and um, the later presence of anxiety problems in adulthood and what was found is an almost linear relationship between bullying earlier on in life as a teenager and experiencing anxiety problems later on. You might say well maybe this is because the kind of people who experience um, bullying and, and anxiety also had other problems to, to begin with like anxiety or family difficulties and these were accounted for in this study but the relationship between bullying and anxiety problems persisted and held um, and this is also found in adulthood so people who are experiencing bullying in adulthood um, experience anxiety up to two, two years or more after the bullying stops. So you might then say if you're feeling very curious well maybe it's our genes um, maybe some people are genetically more likely to experiencing both bullying and um, anxiety. And that's been looked at too um, by looking at in, uh, identical twins who share their genetic material and share their home environment. And what was found is that for twins who differed on whether they'd experienced bullying, the twin who'd been bullied um, was about 70% more likely to go on to experience a particular kind of anxiety called social anxiety, which is characterized being very frightened of being judged by other people and um, uh, evaluated by other people. Um, so what's really clear um, from the research is that being bullied impacts on our well-being, including our anxiety in the here and now, but also in the longer term. And for me, that's a really strong red flag that we need to think about um, really aggressively targeting bullying um, as much as possible. And that should be at an institutional level, but also at an individual level. Um, so what should we do if we witness bullying, if we observe? We need to make sure we upstand. We need to make sure that we don't turn a blind eye. That might, if you feel comfortable and safe to do so, involve stepping in um, when you see it happening, potentially speaking to the perpetrator and the victim to try to calm things down. But if that doesn't feel okay, it might be about speaking to the victim later, helping them um, 
discover how to find um, advice and support, or it might be about sharing the information and your concerns to your supervisor, your line manager, or someone in your college. What about if you're being bullied yourself? The first thing to do is to tell somebody. Even if you're not quite sure that what's happening is bullying, if it doesn't feel right, tell somebody you trust. That might be a friend, a trusted colleague or co, um, co-worker, or perhaps um, a harassment advisor at university who offer a confidential um, ear and support um, for people who think they're um, being bullied. Um, secondly, keep a record. Try, don't try worry about categorizing or labeling the behavior. Focus on dates, locations, and describing what's happening to you. Thirdly, as far as possible, don't retaliate. It can really escalate the problem. And fourth, take care of yourself. Surround yourself with people who support you and love you. Try to build in enriching and positive activities in your daily life. Um, And there's lots and lots of fantastic resources on the web and also through the University of Oxford website. So, but the picture's a little bit more complicated than this. So we know that that being bullied impacts on our mental health, including making us more socially anxious. But work that um, me and and various others have done also shows that that the more socially anxious we are, that makes us more vulnerable to further victimization, which means that we can get locked in a cycle of bullying and anxiety. How does that work? Well, I want to just um, talk you through an example of someone I work with to try to unpick this a bit more. So um, it's Anna, a young woman with social anxiety who I work with, and she talked about going to meet friends for coffee. This is something she was desperate to do and wanted to do. But when she went for the coffee with friends, what happened is she was plagued by a whole um, range of fearful thoughts. I've got nothing to say. They're going to think, why did I invite her? They're going to think I'm a bore. And so she felt very, very anxious and very self-conscious to stop herself messing up and to stop people thinking she was boring, Anna tried to do things to keep herself safe. Think this is what we call safety behaviors. And what Anna did is to stop herself getting caught up in a conversation which she felt unable to manage. She avoided eye contact, she looked down, she didn't ask any questions, and she spent most of the time on her phone like this, scrolling through social media. She also held back, she had lots of things she wanted to share, but she held back in case they weren't interesting enough. These behaviours made sense for Anna because she was so convinced she was going to mess up. But from the outside, for the people having coffee with her, what they saw is someone not looking at her, not looking at them, not speaking, um, and spending their time on their phone. Safety behaviours can send the wrong signal to other people. In fact, they can send the opposite message to what we intend. And the problem with that is that if you communicate to someone you're not interested and you don't find them interesting, that can elicit unfriendly reactions back. People who are low in social confidence can sometimes seek out dominant individuals, dominant groups, um, in order to have a stamp of approval, social acceptability. So rather than seeking out friendships based on shared interests or shared values, people are sought out because they're dominant. And this can be problematic because the bedrock of relation, good relationships are these shared um, values. And also there's an inbuilt power imbalance into the relationship, which can mean that individuals are, are more vulnerable to being um, treated poorly. In addition, if we're low in, social, in our self-confidence, we can tend to criticize ourselves. Um, and that means that we can tend to blame ourselves when something is going wrong in a relationship rather than calling out and questioning that behavior, which can mean that the behavior is likely to persist. So what do we do? How do we break these links? Firstly, if you notice you're perhaps someone who has um, worries in social situations and maybe you recognize some of those safety behaviors, why don't in a situation that you feel relatively comfortable in but a little bit anxious, do an experiment, drop your safety behaviors, really try to absorb yourself in the conversation, get out of your head and go with the flow to find out what happened, happens. And you can also try that in work meetings as well, for example. If perhaps you recognize this idea of being a moth to a, a flame, ask yourself, what do I look for in a friend? Do I see that those qualities in this group, in this person? And if the answer is um, a no, or you're uncertain, why don't you pour more energy into those relationships which are um, based on um, key shared interests? 
or join groups, join clubs where you can potentially forge new relationships. If you tend to doubt yourself and tend to blame yourself for things going wrong, and there's something happening in a relationship that makes you feel uncomfortable, talk about it with somebody you trust. Seek their objective view on it. And perhaps you can ask yourself the question, would you think it was okay if someone acted this way to your friend? And if the answer is no, then no one should be acting in that way towards you either. Um, so we talked a bit about bullying in the past and also bullying um, in the present. If you're somebody who has experienced bullying in the past uh, and it's really continuing to haunt you in the present and it, you're, it's difficult to overcome it, then I direct you to another talk in our series, which is really fantastic called Coping with Trauma by Professor Anka Ehlers. And there you might find some helpful advice and guidance on how to kind of put those ghosts to bed. And finally, um, we know a lot about anxiety and we know we've a lot of really powerful ways to help um, people overcome and manage anxiety. If you are looking for some help to support you with anxiety, um, then you might want to start with some self-help and the Overcoming series is a really fantastic um, place to start. That could be either for you or your child. Um, or if you want something more active um, and support from another person, then you can um, seek uh, evidence-based therapies from the Improving Access to Psychological Therapy Service, which you can access through your GP um, or via a self-referral. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you ever so much, Eleanor. I'm sure people will have found that extremely helpful. Um, I'm now going to introduce our other panellists to you. So hopefully they'll be able to switch their videos on now. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Lucy Bose. Lucy is Associate Professor of Experimental Psychology here in the Department of Experimental Psychology and a fellow of Magdalen College. And um, I'd also like to introduce you to Dr. Robert Hepak, who's Associate Professor of Developmental Psychology, again, in the Department of Experimental Psychology and a Tutorial Fellow in New College here in Oxford. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, we asked people to submit questions in advance so that we could uh, try to uh, organise them in ways that meant we could capture as many people's questions as possible. Um, so I'm going to go to you first of all, Lucy, with our first question. Um, and uh, Eleanor obviously already spoke about some of the different types of bullying that people might experience. And I suppose one of the things that was raised is actually how difficult it might be to spot uh, bullying when it's happening. And actually, it, it might not always feel clear yourself. You might be left a bit uncertain about it. Um, so that there were some questions really about um, how do we identify bullying? What are the best ways to, to be able to spot it uh, in order to call it out when it's happening? Thank you. And, and, and thanks, Eleanor, for a really excellent talk. I think this is a really great question. And um, I was really struck, actually, by the survey that Eleanor included and how much uncertainty there was. And I think that reflects exactly what you say, that some forms of bullying, um, particularly relational bullying and exclusion, are very difficult to spot. And I want to reiterate a point that Eleanor made, really. Um, if you yourself are wondering whether what you are experiencing um, counts as bullying, ask yourself, if this was done to another person, to a colleague, would this be acceptable? Would this be okay? That, that's one very um, sort of quick and easy way to think, actually, this, this wouldn't be acceptable in the workplace. There are some key aspects, again, that were highlighted really nicely in the talk. So bullying um, is defined as being intentional. So these are things that if you have the sense that this is done with intent, so if you are being repeatedly left out of group email chains, if you are repeatedly having work um, requests denied without good reason, um, if you are having experiencing targeted practical jokes, for example, it's recur occurring repeatedly, so it's not a not a one-off, and you have the sense that this is intentional with the intention, you know, to, to hurt you, um, then it is very likely um, that you are experiencing bullying or that a colleague um, is experiencing bullying. So there are different types of bullying, and they. Um, they vary a little bit both on the setting and also on the power dynamics and and that's the sort of final point about bullying behavior it's this power differential and Eleanor highlighted again really nicely it's not always the obvious power differentials although in workplace bullying particularly it most often is managers bullying employees um, over 60 percent of the time you can have it the other way around and anywhere where the power dynamic shifts so if you have a group of people for example targeting one person um 
if you are in a power def differential, which makes it difficult for you to defend themself yourself, again, that's more likely um, to be bullying. I'll hand over to you now, Kathy. Thanks very much, Lucy. Um, and Robert, I just wanted to come to you for any additional thoughts on, you know, the, the various types of bullying that people may experience or witness and, you know, any particular thoughts on identifying those. Thank you very much, Kathy, And thank you, Lucy. And thank you so much also, Elena, for this inspiring talk. I don't think I have anything substantial to add to what was already said. I would just maybe want to point out that as witnesses and as members of a society where bullying occurs, we have every reason to be frustrated and upset and feel a sense of wanting to take action um, in the face of it because in an open, democratic, inclusive society, um, bullying almost undermines our principles of freedom of expression, of social equality, uh, because it's a behavior which, um, which almost uh, is divisive where we seek to be inclusive. It emphasizes social hierarchies and inequality where we're trying to overcome these. So just something that I wanted to add just to point out the scale of this, also to those who are uh, witnessing bullying and um, have heard of it and um, are sort of wondering whether they should do anything at all about it. Yeah, Thank thanks very much. And that actually takes us really nicely onto the next question, which is really about um, how to respond. Um, as Eleanor said, sometimes sort of retaliating may be uh, unhelpful and may sort of fuel the flames but obviously you know it does feel important to respond um, and so and feels important to respond in a way that's going not going to make things worse so it'd be great to hear your thoughts about that you know how should individuals respond both when they're on the receiving end of bullying themselves or when they witness it or, or maybe suspect that they witness it um, Robert can I come to you first on that Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, again, following Eleanor's inspiring talk, I um, don't really have anything to add in terms of what the victims of bullying can do. And uh, I would just maybe want to point out um, on a broader point also how, to, um, how as observers we should feel involved in this process of um, stopping bullying, which is uh, humans are an uh, ultra cooperative species. It's sometimes easy to forget if we turn on the news, but we have thrived in populating the planet by our ability to cooperate. And it's the fact that we don't use this ability to the best ends possible is, uh, can really be considered a modern day tragedy. And so what evolutionary psychologists will point out is that what allows us to cooperate on a large scale is this idea of reputation management that Ellen already alluded to. So building a cooperative identity. If we scroll through our news feeds on Twitter or on Instagram, uh, we see individuals who are basically saying, follow me, look at me, read what I post, like me, share and have an interest in me. And so this is something that we get very invested in. And so bullying uh, targets an individual's ability to sculpture and nurture this cooperative identity. So it gets to the very heart of basic fears and anxieties of being excluded if there's a threat to our ability to maintain this identity. And I just wanted to point this out uh, just to highlight three basic things, which is um, that this is not just an anomaly uh, being bullied and suffering consequences from it is really an integral part of how we form our identity. So this is something that's extremely serious um, and that uh, it is up to observers and to a society to decide what kind of reputation is being nurtured by the bully and by the victim. So we have every reason to step in and take action. And then finally, as a, as a, a minor point, maybe just to be aware of the fact that with social media, things are scaled up. So it's a modern day technology that is amplifying psychological mechanisms that evolved in small scale societies. So being shamed is already bad enough uh, in the face of your family or your neighbors, but now you scale this up to a, a more global level and an interconnected level. And just to be aware of the fact that we're really running into quite serious um, uh, issues if we don't take into account this amplifying effect that social media has and cyberbullying has on uh, being bullied and feeling bullied. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, important um, sort of call to action and, and highlighting the importance of, of addressing bullying when we see it. Uh, Lucy, I don't know if you want to say anything further about, you know, about how, how we might respond that adds to what Eleanor and Robert have both said, particularly, I guess, thinking about how we might constructively approach a bully um, about their behaviour. Thank you. Um, I think these are really, really useful points. 
Um, on the one hand, um, if you're within the University of Oxford, I feel like firstly, um, we have harassment flowchart procedures, which are available on the website. So if you look at Oxford and, and bullying and harassment, you'll see a flowchart, which is really helpful. And it will give you, you know, um, it will signpost you to resources, depending on whether you're a student, for example, or whether um, your staff, um, college or department. So I would advise you to look there because that's really, really helpful. And certainly um, the, the first step of that is always to, to speak up, to acknowledge this. Um, and I, you know, ideally that would be, if you feel comfortable, that could be to the person that's targeting you, but often you may not feel comfortable because of this power differential. So this is if you yourself um, are being bullied, and then it would be to talk to your line manager, ideally with um, records of the behaviors that have been happening. How to address this if it is a person. Um, one thing that I think can be really useful either for the individual or for the manager is based on principles of what's known as restorative justice. And this is bringing people together um, and having a, a platform so that people can have a, a constructive discussion about the situation, about what's happening, so that the person that this is happening to feels heard and supported and can um, explain the impact that these behaviours are having on them. And sometimes that can be enough if the person who is targeting them is unaware of the impact. They, you know, they it may be done for us, you know, for a certain reason. They may think it's funny or they may not realize quite the impact their behaviors are having. So that's one approach that can be really useful. Um, that's better done probably in a, in a structured framework where you have um, an independent party to, to manage this process. So I think that could be a really, really useful tool. And something I wanna pick up on from Robert as well. Um, I think we all play a role exactly as Robert says in society um, to be active bystanders, to not let this pass. So bullying, absolutely, you know, highlighting your point, it exacerbates existing inequalities. So people who are, you know, disadvantaged already for various reasons or have protected characteristics are much more likely to experience bullying. Don't be a gaslighter, listen to them, understand what's happening, hear what's happening and make sure that you do um, whatever you can to support them so that they feel um, that they are listened to and that action will happen. Thanks, Lucy. And actually, you, you touched on there some university initiatives to address bullying. Um, so that was good to, to hear about that. It'd be great to hear about any other initiatives people might know about. And I suppose one of the things I wanted to pick up on in relation to what you just said and thinking about university initiatives relates to the procedures. Um, I mean, you highlighted earlier how often in the workplace um, it may be the sort of the, the more sort of senior person in a managerial role who may be the person who's um, doing the bullying. Um, however, if they're the people who also are the people, you know, the procedures go through them, then uh, that might create quite a difficult situation. And, and somebody referred actually to, you know, that, that those in power marking their own homework effectively. So um, would you be able to say a bit more about any other university initiatives? It'd be good to know about, but also, you know, how to manage that situation, that particular situation. It's a really good question. So one initiative um, that the university runs, that I think is fantastic, is bystander training. So bullying happens within a culture and a climate where this goes un, um, uncharged, where nothing ever happens, where there are strong hierarchical values. It's more likely to happen where there are high workloads and stress. You know, let's let's think about our context here, right? Um, you know, hierarchy, stress, workload, and power struggles short-term contracts, these things do, um, they are structural factors that can play a role. So having a whole community take an approach that this is unacceptable through things like bystander training, which departments can organize and colleges can organize um, via um, the harassment advisors in the university is a really good way of making sure everyone is stepping in. So that's a sort of um, structural level thing. What happens if it's your manager that's bullying you? Again, on that harassment flow chart, it does it does talk about this because that is very difficult. And there are certain you know, people on short-term contracts who have one clear line manager. This is a very difficult position to be in. And the flowchart will advise you um, to go to effectively the manager's manager. So you start, you know, ultimately there may be, for example, the head of department, um, there will be someone in college. You can also um, contact the independent harassment advisors through the university and they will talk you through options available to you. And um, because it's a really awful, position to be in. So I think there's something to do if, if you yourself are being targeted, but I would really like to see departments, colleges take on board this sort of whole collective activity to stamp out this kind of behaviour. 
Great, thank you very much. Um, and coming back to you, Eleanor, I suppose, you know, you talked about how the experience of bullying can often uh, contribute to anxiety um, and, you know, and actually is quite a major risk factor. So when it comes to anxiety, what can departmental heads or line managers do when they become of, aware of anxiety issues uh, within their staff? Thanks. Yeah, I think this is such a good point. And to begin with, at an institution level, we need to encourage and promote conversations about well-being and mental health. So we try and this is there's been huge initiatives to do this, but to try to strip out the stigma that that does sometimes continue to exist within our institutions. Um, and then secondly, tutors, supervisors, line managers are in a, a really sort of unique privileged position of having frequent regular contact with staff, with students. And actually, I think that well-being should be there on the agenda in the meetings. And you can call it a check in. You can call it work life balance chat, whatever. But part of having a product, productive staff member or student is about having someone who's not feeling overly anxious and stressed. And if you do have um, someone um, disclose it or ex explain that they're experiencing anxiety, then the first thing to do is to thank them and acknowledge it because it will have taken them an awfully long time to get there to be saying it to someone in a senior position. And then secondly, to be really good at listening and open. So you want to hear about what's their anxiety like and how is it impacting on their, on their work and on their ability to, to work as well as they would like to. It might then be about developing a shared plan, thinking what could we do together to reduce the impact of the anxiety on their day-to-day -day working life? And then making sure that as a supervisor or manager, you're checking in with that plan. So you don't just create a plan and then leave it hanging, but you're reviewing it and you're adjusting as needed. It may well involve the involvement of occupational health to support that process. And then you might also think about, you know, on the university website, there's lots of recommendations for um, like peer-to-peer -peer mediated support. So um, I think it's called Together All, um, or the, the counselling service at university, or helping someone navigate a referral through to, to more active support. Thanks very much. So we've spoken a lot actually about um, awareness raising and the importance of awareness, awareness raising for mental health and well-being generally and also about bullying and having a, a culture where we could speak about these things freely and um, there was an interesting question really about creating a culture of awareness of bullying and the impact that that may have on um, on people for example on anxiety and I guess there's um, always a uh, it's always important isn't it to think about well what might the benefits be of creating a culture of awareness but could there be any unintended consequences um robert i don't know if you had any thoughts on that thank you very much again kathy just um very brief thoughts in addition to what has already been uh, put so eloquently the um, i think so humans um uh, thrive at their best in cooperative settings if they are in an, uh, in an equal um, status and position where everyone feels like they are being part of it, uh, that they're being recognized. Um, and so the moment that bullying happens in a context where others are watching, it becomes almost a moral issue because as bystanders we become involved. And um, one of the things that has worked quite well also in our evolutionary past is what's being called moral accountability. So to create circumstances, to create spaces, opportunities to hold one another accountable, not in an overly negative or punitive way, but as already was pointed out by Lucy, by a, uh, by a check-in in meetings and as Elena also pointed out. So these are very powerful devices that allow uh, us to check in and to acknowledge um, the kind of norms that we would like to govern our day-to-day -day behaviors. And so this more on the maybe hopeful side and then just as a side effect is to point out that changing the culture is important, but it's of course quite removed from taking action. So culture awareness has to go hand in hand with an attitude change. It has to result in some kind of tangible behavior that then impacts um, uh, those who are in need of help. So it is an important part of it, but um, uh, as Lucy pointed out earlier, it's about being active bystanders and being committed to, um, to feel involved in this process and doing something about it. Great, thank you. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to another question that uh, we received. And I, I suppose we have talked a lot about, um, 
you know, the power imbalances. Uh, and we talked about how often it is in the direction of more powerful to less powerful, for example, in a workplace. Um, but of course, um, and it was raised by people submitting questions that of course managers may be on the receiving end of bullying. Um, and so uh, there were some questions about any thoughts about what to do in those experiences where a manager feels that they're being bullied by a team member. Um, so Billy, um, Lucy, can I go to you for that? Thank you. Yeah, that's um, absolutely, this does happen. Um, and the same, the same sort of processes um, would be important. So to, to understand would this behavior be acceptable in another context, to record what's happening so that you know the time and day and examples and who else was present if other people were present. That's so you can document if it's repeated and, and what's going on. Um, and then again, to, to speak to someone external to the team um, to get that insight is they're all going to be really important. Context is everything. And so to understand, you know, we talked about um, bullying being an intentional act as well. And whether so documenting the evidence and having this discussion and understanding the context can also help to make it more clear whether this is intentional behavior. Um, and this is an example where perhaps using these sort of restorative justice techniques to bring people together might be really effective. And um, because again, in this particular situation, people may be un completely unaware that their behavior can really impact on the health and well-being of their manager. Sometimes we only see the, you know, the, the hierarchical relationship, the fact that they're in a position of power and we forget that actually our behaviors harm others and, and social exclusion and bullying hurts everyone. And it hurts the, you know, it helps the whole community as well. Um, so I think that would be really important. And support is there, and and it's vital that we that we access it and we listen to people. Great, thanks very much. Um, and I'm just going to come to you, Eleanor, for the last question um, and I suppose and I think we could probably um, guess what the answer to this will be based on the conversation so far but there were some questions about you know from an employee point of view and I guess the same applies as students as well so people who are being appraised by others should you disclose that you've experienced bullying or experiencing problems with anxiety um, if you feel that that could negatively impact on for example your uh, your job probation or your assessments as a student, the reference you may receive. Um, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. I think this is such a good question um, because it, the very clear answer is that you cannot be treated differently um, on the basis of having anxiety or being bullied. Um, that is victimization. Having said that, at a personal level, it can feel so very challenging to speak up. And it can feel so very frightening. So there's sometimes a disjoint between the institution and then the individual. Um, but I would really, really encourage you if you are, if it is ongoing bullying, to speak to somebody about it. And harassment advisors, I would say, are a really great place to start if you haven't got a support network around you. Because harassment advisors are not only providing a confidential ear, but they have a really good inside knowledge of the steps and support that's available. Because it might be, for example, that if there is bullying and it's picked up, that you're, the person who's, provided, who's bullying, who maybe your line manager, doesn't provide the reference, doesn't undertake the appraisal. And that process can be moved to another um, uh, member of staff. So I would always encourage talking and sharing concerns as a first step, even if that's done confidentially before you move through more formal channels. Um, and I think the other thing just to say is that um, it's quite an interesting time to be talking about these sorts of um, experiences and this sort of um, behaviour, because I think there is a huge societal shift that's going on in the last few years. And increasingly, we're moving to a place where it is not acceptable to behave badly and get away with it. And increasingly, there's support um, and encouragement for people to stand up and for others to stand with them. And so I think we are moving in a really exciting direction, thinking about you know, recent um, societal movements like Me Too that have happened. There are also, um, I think there's a real um, desire to shift our attitudes to bullying and to support people who've experienced it. Great, thank you very much. I think that's a great note to end on. Um, thank you very much to all of our speakers and panellists today. Um, it's been a really fantastic session. I found it really useful and interesting and I am sure that everyone who's joined us has too. I'd like to obviously say a big thank you to all of you who have joined us as well. Um, hopefully you've been able to join us for some of the other sessions, but if not, please do go and have a look at our YouTube channel, uh, which you can find via the Department of Experimental Psychology website and you'll be able to 
to watch back this session as well. So please do do that and, and let others know. Um, as I mentioned, this is the last session for this academic year, but we'd be really grateful to have your feedback. So please do let us know how, how you found this and other sessions so we can think about what might be best for going forwards. Um, and last thing to say is, of course, hopefully you've got a little gap now before your next activity. Please do make the most of it. Give yourself a little bit of break, of a break, have a little wander, have a little stretch, have a cup of tea, whatever will uh, work for you. But thanks ever so much again for joining us and we hope to see you all again soon. Goodbye.